Welcome to our session on the Everglades. This is the 10th in the series of our Miami Urban Studies course. Um, Miami, do you love me? Um, today's session will be about the Everglades. Um, I'd like to, before um, uh, introducing our guests, just contextualize in some senses the, uh, uh, <clears throat> the, what, uh, the, this presentation today in the context of what we've been doing the last few weeks. Um, over this, over the course of the semester, we've been looking at Miami from a series of different angles. Um, Miami, Southern Florida, and in some cases, Northern Florida. We've been looking at the architecture of Miami. We've been looking at the cultural life of Miami. Um, we've been looking at the, some of the ecology, some extent of Miami, looking at the, the coral and so on. And for these last few sessions, we're looking at really, very much the, the ecology of Miami itself. Um, not just Miami, but also surround, surrounding area. And the final three sessions, we're looking, first of all, at Everglades today, then we'll be looking at the question of, um, of, of uh, the whole uh, idea of Miami being a city in a swamp next week. And then the final session, we'll be looking at um, how Miami is uh, sub suspect to uh, or subject to sea level rise and the problems with sea level rise. So this kind of rounds off our particular session. And over the course of the past few weeks, we've been talking about how we can look at maybe the B side of Miami, that is to look at the alternative side of especially the, of the cultural life of Miami. Um, uh, and excuse me, sorry. Uh, and um, we've been looking at these alternative histories of the very colorful background to, 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 to Miami's background. We're looking at the, the, the glamorous life and the murder of Gianni Versace in Miami. We're looking at Zaha Hadid and all those other things. And we've described this as being the B-side of Miami in some ways. But today we really generally are dealing with the B-side of Miami. This is in fact the, um, um, the very much the, other, the opposite, equal and opposite of, uh, um, uh, side of, of this, uh, aspect of Miami, the, the Everglades, uh, the largest natural wilderness in the States. It's a vast wetland um, to the west of Miami, um, which is home to many rare and endangered species such as manatees, crocodiles, and the Florida panther. Um, and like the Amazon rainforest, uh, it, <clears throat> it represents a very extremely precious, extremely unique natural habitat that is risk, at risk from environment. And, and in contrast to the, the buzz and Miami Beach, um, there are very few humans to be seen here. Um, no bright lights, no buildings, just a very completely natural habitat. Um, occasionally you get a few um, human beings uh, uh, going there um, on these uh, vehicles, uh, scouting around. But as you can see, there's not much actually to be seen here. It is an astonishing um, ecological environment, totally unique in the world, but very few human beings, the, uh, the, the complete uh, opposite, as it were, of Miami Beach itself. And flying over it, um, and as you come into land, certainly from California, you see this extraordinary um, pattern beneath you, um, totally unique in, in the world itself. But then what is interesting is you come at a certain point, you, meet, you reach, a kind of, reach a kind of boundary where the kind of human um, occupied land and the Everglades come face to face in very stark opposition. Um, and in some cases with the, with, uh, the uh, development of Miami um, encroaching right onto the, the boundary itself with the Everglades. And this is many ways is the, the, the challenge of the, of the Everglades, how to protect um, uh, the, the Everglades itself from human encroachment. Um, in some senses, the, the Everglades themselves are encroaching onto Miami, but the, the, the opposite is also true. The, the, the potential to develop the Everglades and the long, this long history of, um, of overdevelopment of, of these extraordinary wetlands that which are now being protected in some ways by law. Um, so today, um, it's a great pleasure to, to, to welcome um, FIU's expert on the Everglades, um, Professor Evelyn Geiser, who is a professor of the biological sciences at the Institute of the Environment. She's also an endowed George Barley Eminent Scholars um, Chair. Um, and she's an aquatic, uh, uh, aquatic ecologist um, who's been looking primarily at algae, but has been collaborating extensively with the School of Architecture. And I'm glad to also welcome uh, my friend and colleague, Albert Elias, who, uh, and former student, I should say, Albert Elias, who has been part of those collaborations um, with Evelyn. There's a, lot, a strong connection between architecture and biological sciences uh, in FIU. Um, so I'd like to welcome Evelyn to say a few words, and uh, Albert also will be talking about some of his research, looking at the use of AR to explore the, um, uh, the, the, the extraordinary world of the Everglades. So let me stop sharing my presentation and pass over to you. Welcome, Evelyn. Uh, <clears throat> it's good to see you. 
Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. And um, I'm going to dig into the um, heart of the Everglades a little bit more. Uh, that was a really neat um, introduction, Neil, with um, beautiful, beautiful photos and uh, a good ju juxtaposition of our um, wildlands of the Everglades with the wildlands of, of the uh, urban Miami. Um, I'm gonna talk about the Everglades from um, the state of, of what I like to call the it's tiny glass houses. I thought that might be um, fun for you guys to think about as architects. I study the things in the little bubble. Um, these are diatoms, they're glass encased algae that live in one of the most predominant features of the Everglades landscape. We all think about alligators and manatees and cypress trees and things like that when we conjure up in images of the Everglades. But one of the most noticeable things when you go out there um, that, you, that you see are these floating mats of algae and they're truly distinctive and really important in this ecosystem. So this is a little outline of what I'm going to talk about. Um, just first, really generally and briefly, why we should care about wetlands. Um, and then a bit about what these creatures called diatoms are. Uh, then I'll get into um, how we are learning about the Everglades from the sort of perspective of these tiny glass encased organisms. And then I'm going to wrap up with a little overview of what we've been um, doing about um, communicating the importance of the Everglades to um, the public via um, different kinds of art projects involving um, these really beautiful organisms. So first, a little bit about wetlands. Um, so wetlands are really important on the planet because they harbor an abundance of biodiversity, upwards of um, 100,000 species uh, live in them globally. Um, they help clean our water uh, because of the rates of production and the dependency of, of these organisms on nutrients. They are really good at cleansing water. Um, they regulate flooding, and that's a very important um, feature of wetlands here in Miami. Uh, they cool the planet uh, because they're flooded with water that holds um, um, temperature better than, uh, better than the air, and so they're, they're important cooling agents. Um, they're important for recreation. Everglades National Park is one of the most highly visited parks, um, national parks. And um, they're, they produce a lot of different organisms, not just fish, that people rely on for um, food and also recreational um, harvesting. Well, wetlands are super threatened, and boy, is the Everglades a great example of this. Um, they're threatened by urban development, suburban development, um, that uh, where, where they're drained for um, uh, you know, establishment of other kinds of land uses. Uh, so we see this network of drainage canals all around South Florida that take the water from the heart of the center of Florida and from the Everglades and pump it out to the sea in order to develop that land for urban purposes and also agricultural purposes. And both of those result in heavy pollution of um, nutrients, fertilizers that uh, then change the ecology of the ecosystem um, and other kinds of pollutants that are damaging. Um, one of the um, important considerations of pollutants um, that the Everglades is threatened by and, and most of our coastal wetlands around the world are threatened by is saltwater intrusion. And that's happening both as a result of depleted freshwater flows into these um, incredible coastal ecosystems, but also due to um, the effect of climate change and sea level rise. And I'll get into that a little bit. Um, and finally, here in South Florida, but also in, in uh, wetlands around the world, um, they're easily invaded by species that aren't supposed to be there, species from other parts of the world. And so we have things like the Burmese python and lots of different plants and fish and um, other species that have taken up residence and are threatening to other native species in this ecosystem. So I am gonna spend a lot of this talk talking about um, 
the, the microorganisms that, again, are often forgotten. Um, they're uh, one of the most important components of the biodiversity of wetlands. And they tell us about these different services that wetlands provide, as well as the different kinds of threats that the wetlands are experiencing. So let me tell you a little bit about diatoms, and I think you'll grow to love them because they're really beautiful and um, often very underappreciated, and maybe you've never heard of them, um, but they're really important, uh, um, not just the Everglades, but um, on the planet. Um, and again, I do like to think of them as plants and glass houses. Here we have what we typically think of a greenhouse when we think of glass houses as a place for um, supporting the photosynthesis of these um, uh, um, of the diversity of, of higher plant species. Um, but diatoms are tiny little plants in glass houses. They're uh, algae-like organisms that are encased in silica dioxide, um, in other words, glass ornamented shells. And they come in a diversity of shapes and sizes and ornamentations. And when we look at them really close up, this is a scanning electron microscopic image. Um, we see all these incredible features, pores and spines and ways that they connect together um, that are really uh, intriguing. And the more you zoom into a diatom, the more uh, interesting sort of architectural features you find in them. Um, so I call them plants and glass houses, and we've always thought about diatoms as plants, but um, now that we're getting a lot more molecular kinds of data to understand the tree of life, um, we find that they're not really plants, although they share some features with plants. And um, this you don't need to get into the details of, but the important point is, um, let's see if I have something to draw with. Um, we have green plants way up here at the top, animals, this is the eukaryotic tree of life, everything is except bacteria. And then all of this stuff is microscopic and here's the diatom somewhere in the middle. Oops, now I don't know how to move forward because I used that thingy. Mm -hmm. There we go. Oh, those thingy stayed, what the heck? <clears throat> Maybe I won't do that again. <laughs> I wonder how I can get them to go away clear. Uh, I'm not an expert on that, unfortunately. Here we go, um, clear all drawings. Yeah. I'm not going to do that again. Sorry. Can you see my mouse? Um, Albert, I see you. Thumbs up. Can you see my mouse going around? Yep. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay. I'm going to use that from now on. Um, okay. So here's some diatoms in their little glass houses. They're ornamented cell walls with all these incredible plastids, um, like these are the chloroplasts that let them photosynthesize, just like a plant. Um, they're also all full of oil droplets. The oil gives them buoyancy and also a food reserve when they go hungry. Um, and, and those oils are actually a really important um, source of biofuel development now. So diatoms are really a target for um, sustainable biofuel development. Um, they actually are, well, they have gametes, we call them diplontic in biology. Um, that means they have sex and that always surprises people. Um, and there are hundreds of thousands of species around the world and each with their own environmental preference. So every species likes to live in a different place. And that's what I'm gonna mainly talk about. Um, they're everywhere. They're in lakes and they're in wetlands and they're in the ocean and they live in these mats that we find in the Everglades. They can even be on uh, the moss on trees. Um, they are teeny tiny. The biggest one is the width of a human hair. And this is the most important point. They produce a third of the oxygen we, we breathe. Every third breath you take in is thanks to diatoms. They are the most productive algae in the world and you know, the two other molecules of oxygen that we're breathing are from plants, forests. Um, but we need to um, have everyone understanding diatoms a little bit better because they are so important in the world. Here's the different kinds of shapes we find. Two major groups, 
long skinny ones called penny diatoms that attach to surfaces and then centric diatoms that are more often found, they're round and they're often found in chains and they grow in the plankton and the open water. Now diatoms, you, if you've heard of them, it's probably because of um, their industrial uses. Um, diatoms have been around on the planet for hundreds of millions of years. And as a result, when they die, they accumulate, those shells never go away. The shells are made of glass, they never go away. So they accumulate in great big piles. And so here's a picture of one of these piles of diatomite um, along the California coast. And that diatomite, uh, ancient dead diatoms, is harvested for things like fish tank filters, um, that's even used to filter fine wine, um, in shoe polish at one time, in toothpaste until people found out that it actually um, degrades your enamel. So nobody does that anymore. Um, and then, as I mentioned, in biofuels, also in pesticides. I use it. Um, you can buy diatomaceous earth, and I do, and I put it in my compost to get rid of cockroaches. Um, diatoms inspire nanotechnology because they have all these, they figured it out. You know, they're, they've been around for millions of years, so they figured out how to grow in chains, how to take um, silica structures and join them together in ways that um, are, are robust to the different kinds of challenges they face in open water and being eaten by things. And um, so you can see these incredible spines and interlocking um, different silica features that are then used. There's a whole field of diatom nanotechnology in the engineering world, and there's even a journal on it. Um, diatoms are also used in forensics um, because you have different diatoms, for instance, well, in every different kind of habitat, there's different species that are identifiable. And so if somebody dies somewhere or by nefarious reasons, and then has moved to somewhere else, um, you can tell because they'll have different diatoms in their lungs from where they were moved to. And so um, sometimes they get a phone call to identify diatoms from the lungs, sort of a CSI thing um, to help with crime scene investigation. Um, the main way that we use diatoms um, in our work in the Everglades is to indicate environmental change. Um, they turn over quickly, they divide quickly, they have really specific environmental preferences, their shells preserve forever in the bottom of lakes and oceans, and they remain identifiable. And that means that we can collect them from different habitats and tell stories about environmental change based on who we find there. I see some um, thoughts in the chat here, and let me just see. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, one of the pioneers of diatom science um, was called was Ruth Patrick. She was uh, the um, she led the Academy of Natural Sciences of Philadelphia um, in her early career, and um, is what is the first woman in the National Academy of Sciences. She's a uh, she was a real pioneer, and she really helped me learn about diatoms. And she said diatoms are like little detectives for the environment, and she set up the um, process by which the United States and now um, the European Union uh, diagnose water quality issues. Um, and so this is, we use diatoms in the US to tell whether or not aquatic ecosystems are impaired. And that was set up in the 1960s and 70s by Dr. Patrick. And so we employ that same kind of approach here in South Florida. Um, we can use it to tell stories about the past because um, diatom, this is a cross section of a lake that is being influenced by a whole bunch of, you know, agriculture and climate and, and industry. And then it has little diatoms in the plankton that then fall to the bottom of the lake in layers. And then we can take a sediment core and look at who was there at different times in the past. And we can see um, things like acidification of the atmosphere that happened due to industrialization, pollution, climate change. So people that study diatoms are very busy um, diagnosing environmental issues, not only of the present, but of the past as well, using sediment cores. 
Um, I drew this little picture of a bird, of a canary with lots of diatoms inside of it to build on the metaphor that um, diatoms are microscopic canaries in a coal mine. So, you know, if a canary is struggling in a coal mine, it tells us, oh, there's um, some poisonous gas being re released. Um, well, if the diatoms uh, go bad, um, if we see the wrong diatoms in our wetlands, we um, know that there's a problem. So there, there are little microscopic canaries um, in, in wetland ecosystems. And, and now I wanna tell you about how we use them as such in the Everglades. Um, so in the Everglades, diatoms live in these things called paraphyton mats. <laughs> Lots of new terms today. Um, paraphyton mats are found everywhere. They're found in the marshes in the central part of the Everglades. They're found in the mangroves that occur in the fringing areas between the freshwater Everglades and the sea. And then they're found um, in the seagrass communities and in our estuaries, like down in Florida Bay. And these are some of the different diatoms that we find in the paraphyton and the heart of the Everglades. These are our diatom canaries. These are the ones that like the na native natural conditions in the heart of the Everglades. They're really beautiful. Um, these paraphyton mats are really unusual out in the Everglades. They um, aren't typical of wetlands. They're, they're really strange. Um, they're adapted to the low nutrient conditions. They're adapted to seasonal drying um, that happens here in the subtropics of South Florida. And they are really cool in the way that they respond to being on a limestone based substrate that gives a lot, puts a lot of calcium carbonate into the water. And what they do is they precipitate out calcium carbonate structures. And those structures cause the mat to adhere together. And it gives it that kind of crusty appearance and, and tan color. Um, they're also held together by what we call, it, it's basically glue, it's just, um, um, mucilage that is exuded. Here's a little diatom under the scanning electron microscope with little pores all along its um, connecting bands that um, exude the, this glue and that glue holds the little diatom where it wants to be in the mat. So these mats are important. They regulate water chemistry they form what we call marl soils, the kind of soils that we find in the Everglades. As I mentioned, they are full of diatoms that are a really important component of biodiversity. They provide habitat and food for aquatic consumers. And in this little diagram on the left is an aquatic food web showing the importance of paraphyton to little invertebrates and small fish and large fish, all the way up to alligators and wading birds. And what I'm gonna talk about mainly is that they respond really fast to changes that matter in the Everglades to things like hydrology and chemistry and pollutants. And here's the story of the Everglades. It used to look like this on the then picture. Um, this is a fake satellite image, a recreated satellite image of what the Everglades would have looked like a hundred years ago where we have Lake Okeechobee and these expansive sawgrass plains, ridge and slough habitat that then drains a sheet flow of water all the way up to the sea, fresh water flowing all the way from Lake Okeechobee down to the Gulf of Mexico. And then in the 1940s and 50s, all this huge system of canals was put in to drain the area south of the lake um, for agriculture and that caused nutrients to flow into the Everglades. Each of the parts of the remaining Everglades were compartmentalized. We lost about half of the area of the Everglades due to development of urban Miami and you know, the whole chain up to Fort Lauderdale and, and West Palm Beach. And um, that resulted in a much smaller and highly polluted Everglades. And so one of the things that I came to FIU to study was um, how much nutrient, particularly the nutrient phosphorus that is used in fertilizer, runs up into the Everglades and then pollutes the interior of the Everglades. 
how much of this phosphorus P is too much. And so we did a big study where we um, sent 30, 15, five and, and control zero um, parts per billion of phosphorus into um, channels into the center of the Everglades. And then we measured different responses. And one of the coolest things that we found was that the paraffin that would normally look like this, this is looking down on a meter square quadrat, normally a fluffy carpet looking mat of algae, upon exposure to phosphorus completely disappears. And that's one of the neatest signals and most visible signals of pollution in the Everglades. If there's no paraffin, things have gone bad. And so we came up with these indications of, of um, paraffin. Uh, this is a lot of detail that you don't really need to know. The main thing is that the paraffin disappears. The diatoms change even before the paraffin disappears, which is why we need to look at them. And we use those signals of change as a way to establish this criterion that's now set at a protective level um, to make sure that the marsh no longer degrades. Well, so we've solved, we've, we know now what the levels of nutrients need to be to protect the interior of the Everglades ecosystem. Are we doing that um, to our best of uh, best of, of the ability of the Department of Environmental Protection in Florida? Not completely, um, but now we're recognizing that this next frontier, now that we have the protective criterion and we have mechanisms in place to protect the ecosystem from pollution, our next frontier is restoring rehydrating the Everglades, restoring clean freshwater flows, especially as sea level rises. So the Everglades has been affected by this depleted freshwater flows because we take all the freshwater, dump it into canals and send it to the sea. This is bad for a lot of reasons. I show you here that the Everglades goes dry for longer and the paraffin dries and cracks and it's not supposed to look like this for a majority of the year. Um, but it also, when we don't have enough fresh water going into the ecosystem, we deplete our aquifer underneath the Everglades that supplies 9 million people in the state with fresh water. Okay, and because we've diverted so much of that fresh water to the sea, as sea level rises, that aquifer gets salty, the aquifer that supplies our fresh water. Now, sea level rise comes underground. Um, salt goes um, into the ecosystem underground because the Everglades is on a limestone bedrock and it comes over land and it makes the ecosystem salty. And so what we have going on in the Everglades is no different from what wetlands are seeing around the world, which is called coastal squeeze. We don't have anywhere for the wetlands to migrate as sea level is rising. We don't have anywhere for wetlands to migrate and wetlands are our source of fresh water to this precious aquifer that supplies us with fresh water. Um, we've been studying the ways that diatoms respond to hydrology. This is one of my former students, Sylvia Lee, that developed a model to infer um, hydro period, the length of time that the wetland is flooded with water from diatoms and, and diatoms give us a really good indication of that. Um, they give us an indication of that in a way that's better than actually measuring it. Um, and I know that sounds strange, but it's really, really hard to measure the length of time a wetland is flooded with hydro period with water. We can't get out to these sites so easily but we can sample their diatoms and their diatoms tell us what the hydrology is like. Similarly, another one of my students, Vivi Mazzi, studied diatom response to the saltwater intrusion. She found different species under salty conditions from fresh conditions, and we're now using those to diagnose where the front of saltwater intrusion is getting into the heart of the Everglades ecosystem. Well, I've told you about phosphorus pollution in the system, about the excessive drying that it's experiencing and the importance of re restoring freshwater flows. And 
the importance of restoring those freshwater flows to combating sea level rise, a problem we're not going to get rid of. So the way that we have to do that is through the comprehensive Everglades restoration plan. And that's shown here. And the middle diagram is our current situation where we have water being diverted from the Everglades through all these thousands of miles of canals to the sea. And the contrast to the historical flows that I talked about where we had sheet flow all the way through the center part of the state down to the Gulf of Mexico. Our comprehensive Everglades restoration plan or SERP is the plan to get rid of these canals that block the flow of water and um, re-divert it back into the Everglades to rehydrate that freshwater aquifer and to support the animals and plants that um, are native to the heart of the Everglades. And this is happening, it's pretty exciting. We have new bridges over the trail that Neil showed you at the beginning of the lecture um, that blocks the, the flow of water from the Northern Everglades to the heart of Everglades National Park. We have uh, two and a half miles of bridges. Um, we're gonna get 11 more. We have canal infilling along the Eastern boundary uh, that now allows for water to be retained in um, the Eastern part of the Everglades National Park and allows that water that's rehydrated under these bridges to make it hopefully down into Florida Bay and the Gulf of Mexico. Um, this is a little bit of video to show you how we access the Everglades. Um, we visit all of these sites here in this map once a year. Uh, we do that by helicopter. And the point of this work is to assess how the Everglades is doing. We throw these traps into the water. We scoop out the algae and all the little animals and plants associated with it and take them home to identify and um, diagnose uh, how the Everglades is. Um, more pictures of how we get around. Oh, yeah, these are animated too. Oh, this is a nice underwater view of what the parapyton looks like. Um, and this kind of conjures up the different little poem to conjure up the different ways we can go on helicopter or by airboat or walking or by marine boat. Um, go a dog go, <laughs> it's not too far. We have this glorious ecosystem that we're able to get into and sample for parapyton diatoms and the little animals that eat them. And here's some pictures of what the landscape looks like across the Everglades um, from the northern part of the system down to the sea. And what the little diatoms look like when um, we get them under the microscope that tell us these patterns of nutrients, hydrology, pH of the water, the acidity, and saltiness. And here's what our diatom flora looks like. Each one of these pictures is of a different specimen. And we take many, many pictures on the microscope to give us a sense of the variation in size and shape that we see within our different species. And over the years of studying them, we know which ones are associated with dry places and with wet places and with places that haven't been polluted and places that have. Ones that like salty water, but low nutrients, salty water, but high nutrients, fresh water, but low nutrients and fresh water and high nutrients from experimental work that we've done. And so in our diatom database, we have um, this massive database with images of each species and then environmental data for each one. And we can come up with a suite of indicator organisms that tell us about these different um, things listed on the right, the hydrology, the oligotrophy, which means the level of pollution. Look, that's low pollution and eutrophy is high pollution. Um, salty, fresh, how much paraphyton they like, how, how much they like to live within these cohesive um, mat, uh, paraphyton mats. And so the different ones that are circled here are just showing you know, what they like. And just to give you a, a feel for the diversity of things that we see. All these incredible different structures and some are better at indicating environmental change than others. <laughs> ¶¶ 
And so um, these images are just uh, showing the ways in which different attributes of our paraphyton communities are changing over time. And so um, you see the little year button here in the upper corner and some of these different attributes. Um, maybe most importantly, the ones on the right are um, two different really uh, typical species of the Everglades paraphyton mats and how they're changing from year to year in our study. And every year we assimilate these data. Um, we look at how these key indicator species are changing. And then we provide a report. Um, and that report goes to, it goes up to Congress um, to tell the managers of Everglades, this massive comprehensive Everglades restoration program, how are we doing at redistributing freshwater clean freshwater into the ecosystem. And the report looks like this. Um, we don't have all those little animated um, uh, maps, but instead we boil it all down to what we call a stoplight system. And we give each one of our sites in the Everglades a red, yellow, or green button based on uh, the diatom indication of, of pollution. And where we see the red buttons, we have um, a problem, a persistent problem with pollution, mainly phosphorus pollution. And the yellow is, hey, there might be a problem going on here. And the green is our baseline conditions. And um, very interestingly in this map, we see some red buttons down in the coastal region. And those red buttons are where the paraphyte mat is collapsing and um, the diatoms that are appearing are those associated with salt water um, because salt water is intruding there due to sea level rise and a lack of fresh water flows, sufficient fresh water flows in the ecosystem. Um, we can zoom in and apply that methodology to areas um, of specific concern where some of these projects are going on uh, to restore clean fresh water flow into the system and we can find out where those projects might be having unintended negative effects on the ecosystem. And we do this um, research directly with water managers and we talk to them all the time and they actually change the way that they're engineering the system based on what we're learning. If they find that what they're doing is causing more problems than it's um, relieving, then they uh, uh, change the methodology of restoration to adapt. So now I, that I've told you a little bit about how we use diatoms to diagnose how the Everglades is doing, I just wanted to end with a little reflection on um, the beauty of diatoms and how we can use it to better communicate how the Everglades is doing um, and the importance of using diatoms in science um, and, and, and of doing science in itself uh, to understanding the environment around us. Um, so diatoms are indeed incredibly beautiful and they've been recognized as um, art forms since the earliest days of microscopy. And some of the earliest microscopists um, were, in, were artists and they sat at the microscope and pushed little diatoms around on the microscope using a hair of a fetal pig. That was what, uh, that was, um, so diatoms as I told you are smaller than a human hair and at the time, the only way to move them around was with something that was strong enough and small enough to actually push them. And so they used these little hairs and they moved individual diatoms around to make these incredible structures like, like this crown where each feature here is a different species of diatom that was on the slide and pushed into where they wanted it to be. And then the color Diatoms are see-through, they're glass, they're, they're completely transparent, but the color comes from different ways that we can tweak um, today the microscope um, to uh, apply color artificially. And so these are actually ancient from the 1800s little slides that were made by early microscopists that um, have been put under fancy modern electron or modern microscopes to, um, to take these incredible images of them. Like even, I mean, can you believe this? That's really amazing. Um, 
And here's a close-up of one of these arrangements. Um, these long uh, stick looking, Y looking diatoms are, are the, well, they're the spines of the centric diatom here in the middle. And um, look at these different shapes. The, this pillow looking diatom is called Bidolphia. It's a common um, planktonic diatom. There's star shaped ones and round ones. And oh, well, so you can see why different, um, why they've been a focus of um, the attention of artists, including artists here in South Florida. So these are some of my friends who are uh, members of this Tropical Botanic Artists of Florida um, group. And these are uh, mostly amateur artists who are normally painting, um, um, you know, the landscapes and beautiful plants of Florida. And um, and they took up interest in diatoms and they, each one of them came to my lab and spent time on the microscope. And it was so much fun to work with them. And they made these incredible paintings. And these are some of them. Here's that same pillow looking Badolfia diatom. Um, and you know, the way that they portrayed them was just so interesting. And it actually helped me learn more about these species to see them through the eyes of these artists. Um, another artist we've been working a lot with, and perhaps those of you that are here in Florida might know, um, Xavier Cortada. He's a, um, a pretty well-known artist down here, and he worked in my lab as a, um, as a visiting um, um, artist in residence. And he did really neat things with diatoms. He took pictures of them under the microscope, and these are um, native diatoms a pair of native diatoms superimposed on the um, a, a abstract map of the city of Miami to suggest that um, they would have been there in the past and now we have this urban conglomeration, you know, bit over top of them basically. Um, he's developed or made these diatom fountains in Hialeah, there's one at Pinecrest Gardens that you can go see. Um, his diatom artwork is um, displayed in one of the turnpike stations in Florida, um, this, on the Sunshine Toll Booth. Um, and so that's been really fun to work with Xavier. And it was partly through collaborations with him that we got to go meet um, the Director of Science, um, Environment and Technology under the Obama administration at the White House. He, uh, John Holdren invited us up to talk about the importance of using art and science communication. And um, then Dr. Holdren, who, who is also, he's, uh, he's a scientist who studies um, fossilizing organisms like diatoms. So he knows all about diatoms, which is really cool. And he told the president about our work and then the following war week, just serendipitously, President Obama had to come to the Everglades or when it came to the Everglades for Earth Day. And we got notification at FIU that he wanted to meet with some Everglades experts. And Dr. Holdren told the office that, oh, well, you know, we know Dr. Geyser. And so it was really amazing. And it was because of this intersection with art that I got to meet the president and talk to him about the Everglades um, back on Earth Day 2015. Um, so to wrap it up, um, I've talked a bit about wetlands being so threatened by land use changes that result in pollution and a reduction in their size. Um, climate change now, especially sea level rise threatening coastal wetlands, and that these beautiful diatoms can give us a tool for detecting the pace of environmental change. They've told us that the Everglades is indeed changing, it's changing fast, but also we're finding some positive early outcomes of Everglades restoration. I didn't get into that as much, but some of those green points on the map that I showed you are places that used to be red that are showing really wonderful responses to rehydration. And finally, this are, they provide this wonderful artistic tool for science communication that probably needs to be explored. Excuse me further. Um, and to um, all of this work that I've talked about is um, work done by people in my lab, especially Franco Tobias. You can't really see him here in this upper photo, but he generated, um, our, he oversees our diatom database that I showed you the details of. 
and um, my students shown here and all the different agencies that have supported our work. Um, and you can learn more at our website if you're interested. Um, here's some of the different news that we have and projects going on. So thank you so much. And I'll be glad to take any questions that you might have. <clears throat> Thank, thank, thanks so much, Eve. That was fascinating. Um, yes, let's let's have some questions. Um, Albert is, is going to make a presentation later on, but let's keep that for later and have some questions. Um, first of all, I guess, I mean, maybe I can um, kick off with one. Um, uh, we have an expression in England, I'm not sure if you have it in the, in the States, that people in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, I just kind of thought, well, I, in the context of what you're presenting, uh, people who, who depend on or live on, shall we say, glass houses shouldn't throw stones. And I'm wow. thinking about the, about the context of how you could, I mean, because the next few weeks we're going to be talking about, um, next week, in fact, Gray, who is here today, uh, oh. will be talking about... Um, uh, uh, about how basically if I use in a, in a, in a, in a swamp, um, we have the, the motto we're using is ex palude aigre, which means bare, barely out of the swamp. And, mm -hmm. and I think the important thing that you, you that you get, uh, you understand you get about um, uh, uh, about the, the ecology of Southern Cala, uh, Florida is, is that you can't draw a line and have you know swamp on one side or the other. It's actually basically the way that the things happen. It, it's uh, you'll never get over that. And I, oh, I, I so I, I, I so we're all connected. So there, there are two kind of um, issues that we deal with the next next two weeks. One is, is of course, the same next week about about how we are st already part of the, of, of the Everglades to some extent, even mm -hmm. though uh, we are kind of separated, as it were. We're still part of it. But then on the the the, the final session, um, we're looking at sea level rise, and I, I, I'm sure you're aware mm -hmm. of the proposal, the, this rather shocking proposal to deal with sea level rise in. Um, in, in, in uh, Miami by putting a, 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 a giant wall, which is about 30 foot high around Miami as a kind of like a trying to contain it, which seems to me kind of a, an impossible task because in fact, the, everything will seep beneath it and uh, right. uh, we'll be part of that. Um, so um, yeah, so it, it, it's a very pressing problem. Um, and there are lots of issues that come out of this. I mean, I, I was I actually I wasn't aware that one third of all our oxygen comes from 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 diatoms. That that is astonishing. Um, I know most people wouldn't know that. Yeah, <laughs> it's really wild. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a, a, but so I mean, my question is ultimately, I mean, a, 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 it, it is what what would happen if we if we lose we lose the the, um, the Everglades? I mean, uh, at some some I'm, point, I'm, it's human problems. We, you know, it's us encroaching on that, and at some levels, some point, it, it's, it's also a, a indirectly say human right. problems from sea level rise. Mm -hmm. What would happen if we if we lost the in Everglades uh, in terms of the ecology right. of the area? Yeah, uh, the the most important. I mean, the most uh, most obvious thing, and we've already talked about, it, is the um, loss of freshwater supply. Um, because of that limestone aquifer, it's where we, we put, if we put more fresh water in there, we rehydrate that groundwater supply through the bedrock and um, then are able to move that water to the, to, um, the sea and uh, combat the infiltration of salt into the aquifer. The ecological reasons are very much the role of biodiversity is wholly misunderstood, and um, even in the you know even in the realm of science, we're still trying to understand the role that all of these different organisms play in the health of the planet. And um, for example, some of these algae that live in these paraffin mats are full of weird metabol metabolites that are um, potential. Uh, you know, incredible sources for uh, different kinds of um, pharmaceuticals. Uh, there are, um, you know, they're the base of the food web that I've talked about that is um, the support of our, you know, provides uh, a really critical fisheries. Um, and of course, all the visitation to Everglades National Park, which is an incredible component of our economy here in South Florida. Um, and, you know, the alternative really is letting it flood with seawater, which, um, I mean, the, the problem is that there's a lot of biological feedbacks that happen if we allow um, sea level rise to unabatedly um, invade the Everglades. And one of the things that happens is, and I just briefly mentioned it, but is that we lose, we lose our soils and when we lose our soils, that invasion by the sea 
becomes even faster um, because the elevation is lower and um, the connection between the subsurface below the limestone and the surface is easier because there's no soil to, to um, block the exchange of salt water with the aquifer. And, um, and so that loss of soil from the coastal regions of the Everglades that we're currently observing is something that we're really worried about. And we know freshwater restoration can combat um, and we're worried about it because it, it redoubles that rate of intrusion uh, into of salt into our aquifer that is barely supporting the population that we currently have, let alone the projected population 10, 15 years from now. One, one further question, I guess, is, is um, what, what I find interesting about the Everglades is that uh, I mean, they are fascinating, but they're not spectacular in the sense of kind of, I don't know, the coralists. I mean, in a way, it's probably a good thing that we don't have massive alligators down there that attract people to come to come and, and, and visit too much. In fact, in some ways, it, it is visited, but not as much. It could be destroyed if it were, became over over popular. And I guess we have this perception <laughs> of... In, of uh, of, uh, with, I, I have some colleagues who work on bio design and they always kind of everything they do is kind of a kind of a, a very beautiful green but actually often nature is not so beautiful it's actually just simply a kind of a sort of gunge a sort of uh, the algae here is kind of like uh, and that you know they're fascinating but not necessarily uh, uh, in a sort of it's the opposite sort of thing uh, of say of, of, of Miami Beach itself where it's always very spectacular image wise and so on it, it's but fascinating I, I, to some extent, maybe it's a good thing that we, we that it's not as uh, full of, of alligators and and weird things as and, and it doesn't get over over flooded with 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 people, I guess. Um. Well, I, I guess I, I um having I, I don't know. I think the Everglades is like incredibly more beautiful than Miami Beach. Um, but that's you know, so it's a point of personal, you know, I, I work out there, I love it, it, it it's glorious. The, um, you know, when you're out there and you see um, everything from the, you know, the sky is just so huge and, and vast and, and each little plant and organism, and, and there are alligators around and there's, there's oh, incredible myriad of, of diversity. And, and some of what's so attractive about it is the um, distinctive weird features that are constantly surprising us. And, um, and I think people are drawn to the Everglades for that reason. And um, thank goodness they are, um, because that is an important part of our economy. Um, interestingly, most of the people that come to the Everglades are from all over the world. They're international visitors. We're trying to get more um, attention to the Everglades by our own communities here in South Florida. Um, you know, particularly, well, you know, I always give this example that I teach a, a 300 student ecology class occasionally, and I always ask them here at FIU, where most of our students are, are local, and, you know, I say, who has been to the Everglades? And maybe five or six of them raise their hand. You know, it's, it's very striking that they haven't been out there to experience the glory and the gloriousness of, of the ecosystem. Um, and, and so I think, um, you know, the park, the national park system has ways built into um, being a national park, a wilderness protection act that keeps the human footprint in the parks to a minimum. And um, so the experience that you can have uh, visiting the national parks are really amazing. I mean, you can get into Shark Valley and ride a bike and go up in a tower and you, you every, as you're riding your bike, you see, you, you're going by alligators the whole time. Um, you, you can go down through incredible trails with a kayak and see uh, incredible things. Um, but, you know, it's a rare experience to get out. It's a, it's an unusual experience to be able to go the ways that I showed you um, by helicopter and airboat. That's something that's limited to scientists. Um, you know, I guess, uh, unfortunately, I mean, yeah, you don't want the interior of the Everglades overrun with airboat trails and um, with people doing things that might not be great for it. But I also sometimes feel like, oh, I'm so privileged to be able to get out there. Um, and I wish everybody could have that experience in the heart of the Everglades. Yet, I also um, take visiting 
my family and friends that come to visit and to the entry points to the, you know, the public parts of the park. Um, I just did a wonderful kayak trip last weekend um, in, in one of the public areas. And it's just, you cannot get over how beautiful it is. It just makes a permanent stamp on your, on, on your whole self. <laughs> it's really amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, uh, could I ask you a question? Sure. Sure, sure. Sure. Um, Evelyn, I, hi, this is Gray. How are you? <laughs> Um, I know you've worked also on the mangroves and the, that when the salt water comes in that it, tr it, it changes from uh, the Everglades ecosystem to mangroves. And I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about what happens during that transition. You know, because yeah. as, as the sea comes up, I guess this is, that's what will happen, right? Exactly. So um, what happens is as the sea level rises and salt water intrudes into the ecosystem, um, into the freshwater ecosystem, organisms that can deal with salt are going to um, move inland uh, if they can, um, if they can do so if they, yeah, if they can. And, um, and so mangroves are good at dealing with salt. And um, if their little propagules, their little seeds um, are, are floating into these areas that are getting a little bit saltier, um, they can take root there. And then they will displace the native vegetation like here in the background, the sawgrass that likes the fresh water. Um, but it takes a, a mangrove tree a while to get going, right? It's not going to be a tree um, for many years um, from a little seed that might set uh, root there. And if the rate of intrusion of salt is faster than that little seedling can take root, uh, what, what we see is this process of, um, of the loss of soil. And I didn't go into detail about that, but the freshwater soils underneath the sawgrass plants out here um, are very susceptible to salt. And um, what happens is salt comes in, it kills, it kills the sawgrass plant. And the sawgrass plant's roots are no longer binding the soils. And so the soils are, un they get unconsolidated, they float around, they move downstream and and we lose that soil. And if that's happening, well, a little mangrove plant could, you know, is trying to get rooted, it probably will inundate, it will cause the, um, the soils are not consolidated enough for the mangrove to, to roots to really settle in. Um, the water is then deeper as well because the soil elevation has declined. And that little mangrove root, root or little mangrove seed has way less of a chance to make it. And so, and so um, encouraging mangroves to set root in these areas and displace sawgrass is one management strategy to um, ensure that we have something in the Everglades as the sea level rises. The mangroves can build soils if they can set root. But the question is whether they can, as those um, as those sawgrass soils are, are collapsing in the presence of salt, and um, and then you know if mangroves are able to set root and, and encroach as they have over the last thousands of years, they've they've done this because sea level has risen slowly enough to let them do that. Um, then the problem becomes what I was talking about: this coastal squeeze where. Um, the, they at some point have nowhere they can go because we have all these artificial boundaries, you know, that um, would keep them from, would keep them and the freshwater marsh from moving further to the interior. So I did that with a lot of hand waving, but <laughs> I should have showed some pictures of that. But yeah, the peat collapse, collapsing peat soils is a real problem out there. So it's just going to maybe make the problem even faster with uh, sea level rising and we're also losing the soil at the same time. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Super interesting. Well, Evelyn, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I'm always fascinated to see the work. Um, it, it always reminds me how much uh, working with scientists like yourself has inspired my work. Um, oh, and I'm really um, interested about when you said that the diatoms inspired nanotechnology. 
And then you're also showing how the items are being used for art. So I guess I have a question about, you know, what are maybe some other applications that you could potentially see, or if you know people that are using um, dye atoms um, with nanotechnology potentially, and um, are there maybe potential applications for um, design? I think there's a lot of applications in design. Um, and there is a, a journal or at least a section of a journal that's devoted to this and a couple of books out there on it. And I'll have to say, I'm, pre I'm sorry, I don't know that much about that field of, um, you know, how dye pumps are, are being used and, and sort of designed. Um, but I, it, it's because the reason why they're being used is because they have these, you know, a lot of them have these really strange, very, you know, nano scale um, interlocking features that evolution has allowed to be just perfect, you know, and, and you know, they're, they're, uh, and, and so that's why um, engineers are fascinated by it because the diatoms have figured out like how to interlock one cell with another to be buoyant in the water column and to uh, not break apart when a little zooplankton tries to eat them. Um, and so these weird, uh, you know, and, and then they have these strange pores, you know, that have um, membranes made of, of silica um, across the pores that that allow for the movement of like, like molecular si uh, molecules across these pores, you know, and so that, that um, pore structure and membrane structure I know is being used in discussions of how to uh, deliver pharmaceuticals, you know, and, and nano, uh, and nano ways and to, and to, and to, um, to address, you know, uh, in the field of nano pharmacy, which I think is, is what that's called. Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm, I'm really fascinated about um, design at the level of molecules and how you can maybe leverage um, some of these uh, types of um, species for uh, maybe developing some kind of structure. So um, definitely super interesting. I also had maybe another question about, um, I know when we were working together, uh, we talked a lot about like the social networking component. We okay. were looking at, um, you know, creating these different types of um, maps to connect the different species. So ones that are maybe more key indicators than others. Um, and uh, maybe you can talk a little bit or expand a little bit on that. Sure. Oh, why didn't I show the social network? I, I don't know why. Um, so the um, I showed you all these different indicator diatoms um, of various things, um, but they're living in communities, um, and they're uh, you know a lot of these indicators of low nutrients or high nutrients um, are all occurring together, and they're um, facilitating the presence of each other by putting out, I did show you a picture of how they, um, they put, um, some of them make mucilage and glue to stick themselves next to another one. And um, it, it's through those little cellular mechanisms that they um, make the environment just right for them in a way that uh, also helps uh, another species. And um, these kinds of mutualistic interactions are prevalent in these mats. And, and that's partly what allows that whole macro structure of a mat, of a carpet kind of thing to form out of microbial organisms. And um, when, you when you introduce an environmental stressor, like a nutrient that um, is something that that mat is not adapted to deal with, um, then you disrupt, you know, maybe just one or two of these guys from doing their thing that supports the whole matrix. And, um, and then the matrix falls apart. And um, so we've been using these network tools, social network tools. It's, it's like a, you know, a, um, social, you know, in a social network where you have um, some nodes that are more important than others. Um, and one of those nodes, one of those connections between people or um, among people or among agencies or institutions or whatever you're trying to map in a social network um, fails, then all the things linked to it also fail. And so we've been exploring that idea 
um, because we think that these little organisms are so highly dependent on each other that there might be key ones that when they disappear, all of their friends <laughs> disappear and um, resulting in a change in the macro structure of the system. <clears throat> I uh, just have some, uh, some questions from anyone. Okay. I mean, I could ask uh, some more. Um, I have a couple more questions. I just don't want to take up too much time. If anyone else has questions, uh, feel free to jump in. Um, but I was curious about, you know, the speed at which whenever you are, you know, using these species to, as a key indicator for um, pollution or for different changes in the environment, um, what is the time frame? Um, is there a way that you guys are doing this maybe in real time or is it a process of extracting specimens and then examining them? And then is that process a lengthy process? What is kind of like the feedback loop that happens to get it's, from the, the, uh, the, the environment to um, mm -hmm. testing and then also then to visualization of the, of the data? Right, that's a really good question. And it always takes longer than what we want. Um, the, uh, you know, we collect these samples out in the field, usually in the wet season from that big mapping program that would be like between uh, August and December. Um, we get those samples into the lab. It takes, you know, maybe three months to process the wet material. Um, we, we oxidize with nasty chemicals to get the little diatoms out. Um, it, it takes time. And, um, and then we, we have to put those on microscope slides. Um, to look at, and then somebody sits on the on the microscope, mainly because we have not developed yet the molecular computational tools to identify them. Um, we still use morphological silica structures to identify them. So, you know, I have people in my lab 24, well, right now it is actually 24 seven, identifying um, and counting uh, individual little diatoms on microscope slides. And that takes, about three months to um, analyze and count and identify them from this 150 sample set that we take. You know, so by the end of the year, um, we have all of our data from the past field season, and we put that together in this annual report with the little stoplight buttons that says, you know, here's how we're doing. And so it takes about a year, and and then that's an ongoing discussion with the. Uh, project managers um, to decide what kinds of actions might be necessary if we're seeing a trend in one direction or another. And, and that brings up another important point about the timeline of, of what we call adaptive management, which is that um, our ecosystem is very variable. Every year is a little different just based on, you know, El Nino conditions or whether it was a rainy year or a dry year, or a, you know, and so, you can't really take one year's worth of data and draw a big conclusion from it. You need many years and you need long-term relationships too with the decision makers to see that the results of the science are actually moving into policy. And um, so it's a lengthy thing. And have you guys um, explored using uh, artificial intelligence with this process? Yeah, there are, um, there are some, uh, I guess the main tool is um, photo imaging um, on the microscope where microscopes, I mean, you know, you can train a computer to recognize different shapes and different ornamentations. Um, and that's used pretty, uh, pr um, fairly well, I want to say, in communities of algae from planktonic habitats and a lot of the marine labs that are doing phytoplankton-based um, tracking are using that kind of artificial tool to uh, quantify uh, their species. Um, but in these aggregate communities, um, it's first of all really difficult to get a super clean preparation of material where, uh, uh, you know, usually our diatoms have, you know, something laying over top of them. <laughs> it's, it's really hard to get them super clean where, it, and it often without that clean preparation is, is difficult for a computer to tell what it is. Um, we also have just so many species, like hundreds of them um, that are different in ways that are nuanced that it, you know, we just haven't gotten there yet. And it would, 
I think it probably is possible, but it's a, um, it's a, it's a, you know, that time of training a computer to recognize, um, to recognize all these different fine, fine features is well, something that we haven't done. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, it, it seems like it's uh, it's always kind of the challenge. I know we've discussed in the past with the decision theater that we were uh, mm -hmm. trying to, to, to develop was, um, you know, a trying to get maybe real time data, real time visualization, or real time visualization, mm -hmm. not real time data, um, to you know allow people to be aware of what's happening. Um, I think is always yeah. definitely a challenge. Um, uh, so I, I'm also mm -hmm. really interested in that as well because of some of the work that I do with um, the that visualization company that I'm that I uh, have uh, started. We are always trying to kind of embed real-time sensors into um, some of the visualizations that we're doing. Uh, so I was just curious if yeah. there's maybe some uh, work that you have done in showing some of this uh, information and data that you guys are collecting in real time. Yeah, well, we do have real-time data coming from our sensors. It's just that that's usually not biological information. It's usually, you know, like all of our weather stations, we get, you know, we can look at that any time of day, or, you know, we can look at water level data and some chemistry, um, sal salinity and, um, you know, some things that are where the sensors are really well developed. Um, and then we have every three day information on water chemistry, water nutrients. Um, but even that, yeah. Oh, we do have real-time data on carbon exchange. That's pretty exciting, where we know the rate at which these ecosystems are breathing from the amount of CO2 that goes from the atmosphere to the plants and back. And, um, and that's a minute by minute, we're, you know, going straight to our computers. So some of our echoes, some of our ecological data actually is coming in live. And um, I know the, uh, the the Bay has had a lot of issues with pollution in the, in yeah. the past, and um, we're looking at, currently in our design studios mm -hmm. how we can better design infrastructure and uh, architecture along this um, Little River as well as the Miami River, yeah. and to kind of really rethink: Is there a way that maybe we can uh, prevent a lot of stormwater runoff and mm -hmm. uh, some of the issues of pollution? Um, mm -hmm. Is there any maybe uh, research that you are looking at that um, is kind of overlapping with architecture and urban urban uh, urban planning in this way? Um, well, I mean, I'll just point, well, wait, 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 can you repeat it? Is there any, arch is there, yeah, are, are there any, curious if maybe there's um, any overlaps that you see with some of the work that you're doing and maybe the way that we um, are designing our cities and, um, yeah, 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 right. well, um, for sure, the, um, the way that we engineer water on the landscape is, you know, because it is all connected is um, we um, really need to take into account how what we do through Everglades restoration influences um, the way that water moves um, around Miami during storms and um, during floods and things. Um, one of the other ways that our, um, the work that I do speaks to uh, uh, um, design and, and infrastructure in Miami is that, you know, the, a lot of the threats to the coastal regions um, are, as you said, from um, core water running out from our estuaries and some of our canals. And, um, and a lot of times that's happening because of failing um, septic or sewage infrastructure. And um, and so there's a real need to upgrade that. I said on the uh, Blue Green Algae Task Force for the governor and where we um, talk a lot about how a lot of the um, environmental hazards that appear in Florida are a result of failing, um, failing infrastructure. And, um, you know, particularly the way that we uh, deal with um, waste. I hope that helps a little bit. And then, you know, obviously these uh, methodologies for combating sea level rise are, are um, need help. Um, the, I mean, the, 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 the engineering solutions of putting up a curtain wall or whatever, um, you know, I think most, most people who are discussing this are pretty, are pretty aware that that's not gonna work. Um, and, and we do have good uh, systems for 
I, you know, I feel like the conversation in Miami is light years now from where it was maybe 10 years ago on uh, those kinds of ways in which we might um, address the sea level rise problem. <clears throat> Is there a question in the chat? I see something. Oh, I see. Just to say, uh, even you probably won't know about this, but to me, less, oh, less obvious. Sorry, I just my, my I think. Um, yeah, that um, in fact, there's a, there's a whole realm of uh, research going on in, in architecture that we call biomimetics or biomimicry, which is not to, which is to oh. say or bio design mm -hmm. in some way, not mm -hmm. not to replicate the forms of nature, but to mm -hmm. try and take the lessons from nature and understand the processes and, and harness them. Um, in fact, one of our, our team was uh, studied on a, on a bio, di bio computational design program in, in Barcelona. So it's, it is actually a big area, the idea okay, that we can learn, learn from principles mm -hmm. in, in natural mm -hmm. systems. Um, mm -hmm. um, so I just want to see if we've got any questions um, from anyone else. Um, I mean, I've got another question myself, but I want to just, I don't want to hog the conversation. Yeah, I, I could ask. Uh, I was wondering what your thoughts were about uh, addressing the climate change and sea level rise issues that we're, that we're facing. Did, you know, what are your thoughts about how, um, what would be the most effective way for Miami to address this? given that these walls won't work. Is there a more right. um, sort of living shorelines or natural yeah. solution to some of these, mm -hmm. uh, some of these issues? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, raise, anything we can do to biologically raise elevation, um, you know, and we know that corals do that and, and, and um, mangroves do that very well along coastlines. Um, they not only build elevation, but they buffer um, they're, they're really good storm buffers, um, getting, you know, again, I, I think that our, um, you know, we, we visualize problems with flooding on our streets during king tides and, um, and, and that's our, you know, kind of human experience of sea level rise, um, and climate change here in South Florida, but, um, we're going to experience, uh, uh more of the subsurface and hidden, effects of sea level rise um, much more frequently and, and much faster, you know, much more frequently than we're experienced much more direly. I don't, I don't know how else to put it. We, um, the, the water supply is going to be the key issue. Um, and it, uh, getting more fresh water into the Everglades is an emergency. And, um, uh, for maintaining freshwater supply and also the building that mangrove, like I talked about, mangrove buffer along our, our um, natural shoreline, our natural shorelines in the heart of the Everglades. Um, but but using that kind of, you know, I mean, I guess that's the biomimicry. <laughs> it's using that natural um, buffering capacity that we know mangroves offer and um, applying that in urban systems is, um, is a really important direction to go, I think. Yeah, and that feeds into a, a kind of vision of what Miami might be, you know, if we did these things, if we, you know, well, I mean, the obvious one, bring more fresh water into the Everglades. And, but if we really valued the, the mangrove fringe, and if we integrated it into, um, into our urban infrastructure, and if we, we were to imagine another system of sewage, mm -hmm. of handling sewage and of handling runoff and of, uh, you know, getting our energy from the sun and that kind yeah. of thing. If we were to embrace all of that <laughs> right. and, and really rethink the city, um, what could it be? It could be I glorious. Think, I think that's there where you go. We get the <laughs> positive feedbacks, you know, I'm, I talk a lot about positive feedbacks that have negative implications A positive feedback. Yes. To sea level rise, this collapse of soils that makes the rate of saltwater intrusion faster. That's a positive feedback with a negative consequence. Positive feedback with a positive consequence is 
planting mangroves along our shoreline, as an example, um, people realizing what it brings, um, uh, cooling um, environment for our uh, coastal communities, um, uh, forests with uh, organisms that are wonderful to see. Um, yeah. You know, that would cause people to recognize the value of it and um, perhaps redouble that, you know, uh, engineering the landscape in a way for that encourages these processes of nature um, to protect us and offer us all kinds of value beyond that. So is there a way to rethink architecture <laughs> that does this, that incorporates, you know, the, mm -hmm. the natural ecosystem into the design at the very, very root and not just kind of looking mm -hmm. nice, you know, mm -hmm. but, but really integrating water systems and ecosystems um, into the way that we think and the way that we plan and the way that we rebuild mm -hmm. the city, you know, is that even possible? Well, I think and you've shown us that it is. And there <laughs> are such incredible examples out there, you know, that, where we can say, oh, look at that, you know, maybe we could. <laughs> yeah, we've had a series of studio, uh, yeah, Professor Nepomechi, Marilise Nepomechi has done a series mm -hmm. of stu studios imagining what the city might look like, yeah. you know, with six feet of sea level rise. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, they're, they're kind of optimistic. It looks like Venice or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. But, <laughs> you know, but I think that if our, if our architectural imaginations addressed some of this, mm -hmm. that it could be quite beautiful, mm -hmm. um, even in the process of, of sort of the changes that sea level rise will make and that, you know, we will have to retreat yeah. from the shoreline mm -hmm. and we will have to uh, sort of pull back and restore some of, the some of the ecosystems in places where there are, um, you know, where there are houses now, particularly yeah. As, as Albert says, along Little River and Miami River and so forth, mm -hmm. you know, but to imagine how that could be, how that could be beautiful yeah. and how it could, you know, engage some of the positive feedback that you're talking about, mm -hmm. you know, and I think of the, the, you know, the mangroves as sort of nurseries for fish mm -hmm. and so forth. Oh, yeah. Um, anyway, mm -hmm. I, I think it's a, I see it as a, as a challenge for architects. <laughs> I think it's the challenge of the, you know, century and of the, you know, yes. if we don't address it, we might not have a next one. I don't know. I think it's that critical. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But just to, to think how it might be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I would just, I mean, I think great. It's quite, maybe it's a question of recalibrating what we think is beautiful because mm -hmm. I, I think in some ways, I mean, I know some very famous figures have been working on bio design, and it's always mm -hmm. this very glamorous, beautiful green. Everything, everything, amazing yeah, green. Yeah. But actually, uh, nature is 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 can, can be brown and gunge, and it, it, that's largely what what it is. So, in some ways, you have to be able to see the beauty in the in this system here, and not the kind of. I guess as architects, we privilege the visual in a very literal way. You know, mm -hmm. a tower block by famous architect would be our be idea of beauty, and me to mm -hmm. recalibrate and think about the the world. Well, Absolutely. in a different sort of way. Probably, you know, making sure, I think that um, impressions of, you know, what's beautiful are of course personal, but I think they're so much guided by our experience and what we're exposed to. And so having, having, you know, providing opportunities like you're doing here of exposing people to here's, you know, what's so cool about the Everglades and, you know, hopefully it makes people more likely to want to go see it. Um, you know, can, can we do that um, broadly in communities so that people do have a new sense of what, you know, what, what, what are natural ecosystems like? And um, I think it, I, I've experienced anyway with my students who I do, these 300 students that never been in the Everglades before, and I do take them out there, they all, every single one of them comes back saying they will never forget it. And they cannot, absolutely cannot believe how beautiful. And, 
I mean, they continue to write me 10 years later, you know, I'll never forget that. And it really caused me this whole new appreciation of the beauty of this ecosystem. So, you know, I want everybody to have that so that what you're saying and talking about, which is a huge challenge, how do you, how do you get, uh, you know, particularly urban communities to recognize the beauty of nature and incorporate it into every aspect of urban design. Um, you know, I think it's just all about exposure and, um, you know, and, and creative visioning like, like you're doing and um, I'm blending those. And, and there's just such great, great examples out there where that's been successful, you know? And so I think, I, I think. Um, yeah, right on, right on Lincoln Road on Miami mm -hmm. Beach, there's mm -hmm. a little installation of the Everglades and it's oh, yeah. just, it's yeah. spectacular. I love that. You know, of course, it's kind of the Everglades on life support, right? Because yeah. it, they have, it, the, the maintenance of that thing is extreme. Sure. But nevertheless, that the they have a cypress tree and they're fish in the pond and, yep. a, and the the you know I, yeah the pond there on uh, on Lincoln Road, it's not the sort of pristine chlorinated water. It's mm -hmm. actual real living water with yeah. fish in it and algae and everything else. And mm -hmm. and there's a sort of introducing people to that beauty mm -hmm. as a as a designer. I think is mm -hmm. a wonderful. Uh, mm -hmm. Wonderful challenge. Um, um, I have um, a comment. I don't know if it's a question or is it, it's more of a comment that Gray mentioned that uh, with uh, the rise of uh, water, uh, the sea level, uh, that we are going to retrieve you know, instead of uh, mm -hmm. we, we have to retrieve. But then I was just wondering if we could uh, potentially use uh, nature to design uh, something that could be part of the water and then and build yeah. up above uh, water mm -hmm. with with nature uh, mm -hmm. uh, or use uh, because nature like corals they stay on on the surf on uh, on the floor so they are a structure itself so could we just potentially emerge and then blend in with with uh, the environment instead of retrieving I don't know. Can you imagine it? <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> I don't know how, but <laughs> but that would be an interesting challenge to to think of think of a city above the water or something like that. You know, I mean, of course, it's going to be hugely expensive, and but it's a it's a challenge to the imagination to do it in conjunction with scientists in a way that would, um, in a way that would work. So, so if, 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 if it, never say never. <laughs> so we are bringing it. Uh, so we, we, we like to bring it in. We have installations uh, to bring nature closer to cities. So um, could we potentially bring that in uh, more actively to architecture. I mean, Maybe. sure, yeah. Go ahead. It, it just say, Anna is actually what is in Australia right now and uh, um, just showing how, how how far ranging our students, our, our mm -hmm. candidates are. Um, just, I mean, I think one of the things about, about Australia that is interesting to, to Anna, of course, is the whole barrier reef and, and the bleaching of the barrier reef, reef with global warming. Is, is, apart from the sea level rise, I mean, what as, is, would, if it weren't for that, would, would the Everglades be resilient to that, to global warming, or, or would it suffer the way that coral suffers? Um, Hmm. Yeah, that's a really, really good question. I mean, we do focus on um, the saltwater intrusion aspect of climate change down here because it is the primary way that the system is being changed by climate change. But um, we also are documenting increasing water temperatures. Um, we have more CO2 in the atmosphere, which changes the ways that plants produce. Um, and so there are many different, um, you know, oh, 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 the big one is um, a change in the periodicity of rainfall. 
and we're anticipating that the Everglades might be a much drier system in the future just because of decreased um, or lengthened dry season periods. Um, and so there's there's a lot of a lot of challenges all coming together as a result of, of climate change. And um, we discuss these not only from the perspective of their influence on the um, you know, how we might measure their influence on the ecosystem, but also in some of the urban scenario planning that we've done, um, thinking about resilient futures for Miami, um, where we can, uh, you know, envision different uh, ways that we can cool our, our neighborhoods by um, reforesting them thoughtfully uh, so that we don't have such a heat island effect that would become worse as the climate warms, um, you know, and, and things like that. Um, ways in which we, the, that same reforestation can um, perhaps uh, um, offset some of the uh, um, carbon dioxide emissions from our city. And, um, I have a question about sea level uh, rise. So when when the sea level uh, rises because of the melting of the, uh, the ice, which is not really salty water. So that's, how does that affect? So it, it affects the oceans, uh, the salt levels. So how would that, that also affects the, doesn't it reduce the amount of salt if the water uh, invades the, uh, the Everglades? That's a great question. And um, what happens is that the glacial ice melts, but it causes salty water. It's a, it's a big oceanographic process, or um, the um, seawater melts and it is fresh and it, it, um, it uh, causes the salty water that's below it to actually upwell. Yeah. And um, it, it uh, in the grand scheme of things, um, does not affect the salinity of the ocean water. Um, what it does is raise the uh, um, level of the ocean um, in two ways. One is just by the melting of the glacier itself, um, which is, but the main way is by um, it's, it's the warming of the water itself and the expansion of the distances between molecules that is raised, you know, um, uh, largely responsible for the rise in the sea level. And it's a combination of things, um, but partly the, the increased temperature and molecular distances that cause the water to um, rise. Yeah, I, I can add a little bit that, uh, that the, the melting in Greenland is dumping fresh water into the North Atlantic, which is, I, which they say is slowing the the Gulf Stream. Yeah, and that uh, that large overturning current and, and the Gulf Stream because when it's pulling hard, um, pulls water away from the Florida coast. The Gulf Stream comes extremely close to the Florida coast, and all but all along the East Coast, it it pulls water away. And therefore, our sea level locally here is affected by the um, by the Gulf Stream, as well as many other factors. And there was a point a few years ago where there was a you know a, a change in the Gulf Stream, and our sea level went up about five inches. Yeah. And I think it settled down, or it's it's pulled back a little bit now. But it was a you know a funny phenomenon. Huge jump. Mm -hmm. They had measures right off of um, right off of the coast, and you could, you know, you could see the change. So it's complicated. Yes. Even one one question I had is, you gave a presentation a while back to my students, which was completely fascinating, and you're describing the very unique processes that go on in the Everglades with like two contradictory levels of water, um, well, two different flows. Uh, do you, do you, could you explain this? Explain, remember, I was just trying to kind of recall what you were saying about that. It has a, a counter flow and flow all at the same time. Is that correct? Um, I think probably what I was talking about was this um, balance of fresh and marine water that are that are constantly 
push me pull you. So during the wet season, when we have some fresh water flowing into the Everglades, it's pushing that saltwater wedge back. And during the dry season, um, when we don't have that fresh water flowing, the salt is able to move in. So it's constantly going, that zone of transition between fresh and salt water is constantly moving um, back and forth um, within a year. Um, but what we're seeing is that it's moving in and in and in, you know, over many years um, because we have less, less fresh water moving in than we need um, because we're putting it all up to the sea and the canals and because the sea level is rising. So I think that's probably what you're referring to. Yeah. Uh, uh, just to, to think, uh, is there any other ecology around the world that is in any way kind of uh, comparable to, mm -hmm. to uh, uh, Everglades? Well, it's, um, you know, this ecosystem and um, a lot of the features that I talked about um, is distinctive of, of um, coastal wetlands that are on an ancient carbonate platform. You know, we're on this um, limestone. And so there are other regions of the world where the coastlines are made of, you know, ancient coral reef, you know, limestone. And um, uh, the wetlands that I was going to talk about this, but there wasn't time. There's um, wetlands all around the Caribbean um, in the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico, the Zapata wetland in Cuba, um, these expansive freshwater marshes uh, along the coast of Belize. Um, all around the Caribbean that are I, uh, nearly identical to the Everglades. They may have a few more tropical species, but functionally they, they look and feel and seem identical to the Everglades. Um, I've done some comparative work in other what we call karstic limestone-based regions um, in Australia and in and New Zealand. Um, and uh, there we also find really similar communities. You find the paraphyton mats, you find the mangrove forests, different species entirely, but same functional um, sort of structures. And, um, and so, yeah, uh, a, lot of the, a lot of what I've broadly talked about, this coastal squeeze, the push me pull you of fresh and salt water, that's ubiquitous to all coastal wetlands. And, um, and, uh, you know, uh, coastal wetlands are um, the predominant feature along the world's coastlines. They are um, constantly being encroached by people because the majority of the world's people also live on coast. So this actual interaction between people and coastal wetlands and the way that it's changed, both are changing <laughs> with sea level rise is definitely not unique to Florida, uh, South Florida. Um, we happen to be at a very super low elevation that makes us more susceptible to that in the near term um, than many other places. But uh, there are lots of examples around the world, including in um, probably the best is in the uh, Murray Darling Basin um, and the coast of Australia. Uh, that is a really good comparative ecosystem to the Everglades and is um, really a pro like that basin that su supplies most of the people of Sydney with um, fresh water and, and uh, like it's really an almost nearly identical problem of salinification and, um, and, and depression of that uh, normal ecosystem function due to saltwater intrusion and, and um, population expansion. I have a, maybe a question that kind of relates to um, what Neil was talking about with uh, water flows, right? Mm -hmm. These two counter flows. And, and I'm curious, um, I know that traditionally or historically, um, these water flows would come through where we have basically built this, our city, right? Mm -hmm. And now most of those water flows, if not all of them um, coming through the city are controlled by these canal systems, right? Yeah. Um, so I'm curious, is there um, a way to maybe go back and reverse some of these things? Or is it the, the way that the city's developed and designed, mm -hmm. it's impossible and it's always gonna be this mechanical process. And maybe right. um, the integration of some of these living shorelines are changing how these maybe edge conditions were um, the land meets water, is there a possibility to maybe have more of a natural flow again? 
Yeah, it's easier to do that in parts of the system that already still that still have um, some natural components in existence. And so a good example is the um, expanse of wetlands between um, Cutler um, Bay and uh, Biscayne National Park along the eastern um, edge of uh, Biscayne um, Bay, uh, where we call that the Biscayne Coastal Wetlands and they're really beautiful uh, sort of shrubby mangrove forests um, in there that have been all dissected by canals. And um, uh, that area is a big focus of now the expansive Everglades Restoration Program, um, where a lot of water is going to be diverted and put back into these wetlands. Um, the canals are gonna be blocked and already some of them are. Uh, culverts are being built and these wetlands are being rehydrated in order to um, uh, encourage the mangroves to reestablish or to um, encroach in these areas, build soils and be a buffer for uh, the southeastern portions of, of Miami-Dade County. Um, I think we have similar examples, maybe up by our Biscayne Bay North Campus, you know, where we have Olita State Park and um, some re-engineering of the way that water moves around there. Um, some opportunities even on the um, FIU's campus that I wish could move forward for um, repopulating, uh, um, you know, building whole entire shoreline uh, development um, projects that would provide an example for how the rest of the city might do this. Um, let's protect our own campus and show how that can be done and, um, and see whether or not that's a possibility for other regions. So in your opinion, do you think that um, there is a possibility to have a city um, that can work with nature? Oh yeah, I totally believe it. I mean, you know, Wagner Creek, I mean, there's some of the creeks that are going into Miami River you know, there's already projects going on and um, th that are really great, you know, building wetland buffers and allowing water to move around a little bit more naturally, um, creating features around them that people enjoy seeing and can, um, again, get, getting back to Grace Point, be exposed to in a way. Um, so I, I believe it is. We're actually exploring some um, fractal um, geometries in, in the studio because um, we have this kind of uh, idea that maybe having this extra surface area or all these different nuances in, in form, it gives an opportunity for um, these microorganisms to start to accumulate in different soils to accumulate. Um, do you think that this is a potentially a good strategy given uh, your research and maybe um, what you're looking at in regards to the water flows through, uh, through the city? Sure, I think any way that we can um, take innovative methods and explore possible scenarios for what we might implement. Um, and if that includes, uh, you know, playing around with microbial processes, all the better, because um, they are what's responsible for ultimately what happens to our soils and elevation. So yeah, it's a super great idea. So I'm uh, just wondering what there were any other questions for, for Evelyn. She can't stay at the whole time because you have a lecture to prepare. I you? have, well, I have a lecture at 11.30. So, um, okay, okay, but I, okay. I really don't want to run right up against that. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, no, I think I, what I'd say is that this is, I mean, uh, even though on the whole, we architects are on the wrong side of the fence, as it were, in that we, you know, we, we, we're on the, we, we, we depend upon developers to ask us to go and kind of to produce projects often it, that, that actually clash with the natural system. There is a huge interest in the biological within mm -hmm. within a contemporary architectural culture of okay. learning from natural systems. Um, mm -hmm. and the diatoms themselves, I think, are fascinating kind of microcosms of of ways of thinking. And, um, you know, typically, I mean, that we we have some uh, I can think of one of my colleagues in in, 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 in Stuttgart in Germany, Akim Menges, who always starts his projects by looking a model from nature how can we learn from this kind of system so mm -hmm. it's something that is very 
pervasive and um, uh, I think even among our group there is a lot of interest in the kind of bio design and how do we work in harmony in nature and I think that's the, what Albert uh, was was talking about where he puts his finger on the, on, the, on the real issue is how do we still build but in a way which is not kind of um, uh, oppositional to the kind of natural forces and I think that um, uh, within architectural culture as a whole there's been a lot of of kind of um, of interest because typically we think about urbanism you know that's being yeah, it's yeah. all about urbanism sure, and now yeah. figures like Rem Kohlhaas are saying yeah but what about the countryside and and, and how mm -hmm. about we, dealing with that so it is it, it has become a hugely kind of high profile thing and, but, and it was kind of ironic perhaps that mm -hmm. there was an exhibition um, at the museum at um, MoMA in New York, um, mm -hmm. there was a, an exhibition by our, uh, Rem Kohlhaas, one of the most famous um, okay. famous architects out there, yep. about about the countryside, and it was in the center of New York that that, that, it, that he made this deliberately as a kind of gesture in some ways, and of course it was unfortunately it was shut down because of the of the oh, uh, the COVID thing, but it's just it's just struck me that the COVID situation right now in Miami Beach where we have thousands of people. That are, are kind of really problematic. I mean, the, the perfect antidote is to, to enjoy this exquisite solitude of the of the Everglades yeah, yeah, as right. a kind of antidote to that. Mm -hmm. um, so, well, that's a uh, very um, positive way to. I mean, I'm I'm glad to hear that. I figured that, and I think that the only way out of the mess that we're in, term in terms of um, thinking about a sustainable future for our planet is exactly through what you're talking about. We have to, there isn't, we don't have an alternative. We cannot keep doing business as usual. Um, so it, it's exciting. And I think that biology offers so many cool examples. It's kind of why I decided, okay, I'm gonna show you a little bit about diatoms because oh, no. there are these, these little houses and <laughs> they, they have some cool features that might do some so, inspiring <laughs> exquisite that they're, they're super interesting and i know i was i was when i was teaching the architectural association i was i was doing a lot of lot of algae which algae okay. themselves are just yeah. Uh, I mean, actually, the trouble is that we see it in terms of the beauty of the thing itself, but actually it's the system that it's part of we need to oh, yeah. rethink. Yeah. But we're always attracted by glamorous, uh, exquisite, um, these mm -hmm. kind of almost crystalline forms are, yeah, are, yeah, yeah. are beauty and beautiful in themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I wanted to, if, there's, if there are no f uh, questions right now, whether it's time to invite Albert to talk about some of his collaborations with Evelyn, which um, have been... Over the years, very productive. There's an ongoing uh, a collaboration that Gray is also part of, and Sheen is part of, between the kind of biological sciences and, and architecture itself. Uh, but would you like to uh, maybe sure. say a few words about the collaboration? Um, yeah, so we were looking at creating a decision, uh, decision theater uh, and basically trying to make a visualization in virtual reality. And uh, at the time, we were using the IK facility. If you guys are familiar with that. Um, in order to create kind of a visualization that can better inform policymakers um, on some of the research and data that um, Evelyn and her team were developing. So I was uh, working with her in order to develop the uh, visualization side and the data visualizations for this environment. Um, and uh, funny enough, I was doing my thesis at the same time with, uh, with you for the design fiction. So I was doing a lot of work in uh, real-time environments, doing a lot of coding and scripting and video game engines. And that's kind of how um, we started working together. And um, I know we had, I had mentioned that uh, we were looking at social networking for these uh, species. So basically we were uh, uh, trying to do is, um, which I'll, I'll show an image of later, was trying to create these, uh, these networks in, a, in the 3D environment. So we, we found that it was really hard to try to uh, build the whole Everglades in, um, in the software just because it was just way too heavy. And there's way too, uh, too much information and processing all that data and information in real time was very challenging. So this other approach was to kind of create this almost like game where you're in this 3D environment and you're basically picking out the key indicator, indicator species. And like if one key indicator species like uh, vanished, then you would see how this web or this social network would fall apart. So um, I'm sure like if, if we picked up the, the project and the research again, there's probably tons of ways that um, we could push it even further, especially now that the, uh, the software has been more optimized and, um, and I'm really curious to see like what are maybe some of the potentials with integrating AI into some of these things. So uh, definitely maybe a lot to explore in the future. Do, do, you, do you want to show any visuals of, of what you were doing in terms of your, your research? Sure. With, you know. sure. Let me know if you guys uh, cannot see this. 
Can you guys uh, see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I, I think really um, the, wor the work that I'm showing is, I think really a lot of it is kind of inspired by collaborations like this with Evelyn and um, other research researchers and faculty at the school. Um, so a lot of the work that I've done has kind of been a, a collection of working with uh, different scientists and different uh, talented people. And um, I think really the main kind of focus for me is thinking about myself almost as an architectural scientist. So I know Neil, you had mentioned that, uh, many times that architects kind of like to get um, ideas and inspired by nature. And, and definitely I think at the, the cornerstone of, or the, the essence of all the projects that I've worked on is this kind of environmentally focused and uh, approach around physics and science. So although I don't fully um, have a, a large knowledge or background in it, um, I like to work with people that do, uh, people like Evelyn, and try to rethink how we can um, think about some of these natural phenomenons from nature and um, apply them in different ways. So um, many of my work is just doing lots of these data visualizations uh, for converting uh, information into something that's meaningful for people to either um, better inform uh, the general public or to try to maybe um, use them for architecture. So this is the decision theater. This is the IK facility that we have at FIU. And we were trying to basically um, create the whole environment, this virtual environment, this Everglades environment in the, uh, in, in the uh, IK. And the idea was that you would have these sliders that um, would show like the change of uh, water. So as water is rising or as uh, salt water intrusion is happening, you would see in real time how the um, environment would maybe start to uh, decay or you would have that soil um, starting to, to, to vanish as uh, Evelyn had spoken about. Um, but again, at the time, the, the, the software was not, uh, it was very heavy to try to bring all that information in and we didn't really have um, the capacity to do so. Um, so we, uh, this is the trip that uh, I went out with uh, Evelyn um, to, to see what she was uh, referring to um, in regards to how beautiful it was. And definitely um, my trip out there has really changed my perspective of, uh, of the Everglades. And um, I, I didn't realize how much uh, beauty you can actually find there. So um, I, I totally get what she's saying whenever uh, her students tell her that it's changed her life. It has definitely changed my approach to some of the work that I'm doing. And it d definitely inspired my thesis project um, uh, pretty, uh, in, in a lot of different ways. So I think one thing that she's mentioned about how um, uh, this paraffin or these diatoms uh, inspired nanotechnology, um, I, I really uh, related to that a lot because that's kind of what my focus was for my thesis. It was all about thinking about and questioning what happens to design at the level, if you're designing at the level of molecule, what happens to architecture, what happens to technology. So really investigating synthetic biology and um, nanotech in regards to design and design fiction. Um, so this was the, this networking uh, game that we were trying to develop. And uh, the idea was that the, the, the key indicator species would be the nodes that are gonna be connected to more. So if um, a, a key indicator species um, vanished, then you'd start to see maybe the map falling apart. And then that would basically um, be maybe a, a related to some of the things that uh, Evelyn was talking about, where you might have an area of saltwater intrusion uh, or an area of uh, high pollution, which is causing these effects. So this is kind of like an idea to get people into the molecular scale and understand how these uh, complex diatoms and behaviors work and why, why they're important. So why are they, um, why is it important to know, you know, how, how these uh, species or these, uh, these specimens uh, really improve and help our environment? So it's just like a VR environment. Um, and then I think a lot of this work has uh, also been in regards to our conversations about how we can use this for urban design. Um, we've been doing the Design 9 Studio. Um, I've been doing it for about three years now with my students and also working with uh, Professor Spiegelhalter, Tom Spiegelhalter on um, his project Crunch. And we're looking at different um, ways that we can try to extract data and try to rethink how we, can we improve our cities and improve architecture um, in, in light of climate change in the next hundred years. And really trying to envision um, what uh, the city of Miami could be in a hundred years. So we, we do have this kind of uh, approach of, yes, we're using, real we're using real data. We do a lot of GIS work and we're trying to envision what that might look like. 
but there's also a sense of design fiction that goes in with this, right? Um, we don't know what a uh, hundred years in the future will look like and what technologies we're uh, maybe expecting to, to come up in the next hundred years. So a lot of this is really looking at um, kind of put, uh, focusing, uh, kind of imagining uh, further than um, what we currently have and seeing what the city might look like as a result. So this is just a, a, a combination of images from uh, a series of studios I had done with um, my students and all kind of relating to the workflows that we are investigating with uh, uh, Thomas and uh, the Crunch project. Um, and and it's, I think it's, it's funny enough is that, you know, in a way, in a strange way, after Evelyn's presentation, it really reminded me of a lot of things. Um, while I was working as a student, I actually started, I got into com the computational design and, and computer programming um, while doing a, a studio project with uh, Professor Nepomechi. And um, uh, as Ray had mentioned, she has done a lot of uh, these studios where they're looking and investigating, you know, how does, how does the city uh, change? How can we reimagine the city um, in light of sea level rise and in light of climate change? So these are just a series of images that I had uh, done leveraging GIS to uh, create these maps that can kind of tell that story and to show, you know, what are the opportunities what are the challenges and um, how to visualize that? So and to do that, it took, a, it took me a, a while to kind of figure out, hey, how do I learn to program? So I started uh, taking programming courses and teaching myself how to, how to code. And then, you know, it took me another maybe uh, two or three years to figure out, okay, I have this, uh, this skill now, but how do I turn that into something useful for design, architecture and visual storytelling? Um, so at the same time, um, as I was developing, um, my background in computational design, I was working on another uh, uh, grant with uh, Professor uh, Lissi, and um, the project was called Scope, and I guess relating to data and BIM, um, uh, in addition to maybe having a, a strong uh, background or strong, strong interest in natural systems and uh, physics as kind of a uh, cornerstone for the work that I do, um, data is always kind of a main component of that. So what we were doing here was we were basically using uh, building information modeling and trying to create a virtual reality and augmented reality app to kind of allow you to have an X-ray vision of a building and the systems inside as a way to um, have a, a, a better way to educate uh, students on um, how some of these systems work in a building. Um, but it was kind of, it was a very challenging project because um, at the time, uh, the sensor fusion, the, the, the sensors and the devices, they didn't have the capability in the mobile phone in order to overlay things properly. Um, this was literally the year before they released that, um, that technology, that software update to allow your phone to better accurately overlay information. Um, so we really struggled with uh, developing the AR at that time, but we did manage to develop a series of virtual reality um, um, examples that we were then put into the eye cave and um, the students were able to um, visualize these different concepts. So this is a, done in a video game engine and just kind of importing that, that data to get these real-time visualizations so you can kind of see how these different uh, changes on the building in different times of the year uh, might affect the, the, the systems of the building. Um, I think these are just more videos of like, so like importing the um, wind and um, the wind flows into the into the environment to kind of see how uh, that basically uh, the building is responding to these things. And I think um, from that I, I started working when I, when I first graduated my first master's I kind of took all this collection of knowledge working in uh, from augmented and virtual reality um, computational design. And I ended up uh, working as a software developer um, for VR and AR applications for a creative agency. Um, and so we were doing a lot of uh, VR work, VR applications um, that basically uh, visualize uh, different projects and developments um, in Miami. Apologies if this is loud. But um, just basically kind of doing a lot of VR work around uh, visualization and um, putting that into applications that would run on the uh, mobile phone or tablet. Um, so after, after my, uh, my work there, I really started getting into augmented and virtual reality even more. Um, and I started my own data visualization company that was focusing at the time on architecture. 
And then in uh, working with my business partner, we started uh, getting more and more into real estate and urban design. So we developed uh, a couple of different uh, prototypes for um, how you can convert physical material such as like a pamphlet or a brochure and to make these uh, augmented reality for, uh, visualizations. Um, and really the idea I think that I'm interested in with augmented reality is and virtual reality is, you know, how do you take things out of the computer and make them maybe tangible? So I'm really interested in um, trying to kind of um, take data and take information and make them um, uh, tangible, right? So it's not just maybe in the computer or living in the computer, but it has a life or a presence in, in reality. Um, so this is another example of that one we did for um, the city. And we're basically looking at how we can um, convert, you know, tons and tons of information that was typically on maybe a, a brochure or a pamphlet. And how can we then condense maybe 50 pages of information down into one page and one intelligent page? So um, I call it a 3D intelligence platform because it's really focused on visual storytelling and data visualization, but um, condensing all that information into one place where it makes it accessible to everyone is uh, what we are interested in. And so a lot of this is looking at um, conversion of GIS data, um, a lot of uh, scientific data that we maybe had access to from the client, um, um, BIM models, building information models, and um, images, video, and embedding that into the, um, into the environment. So we're always leveraging a video game engine to um, build a lot of these things. So this is the conversion of some uh, building information uh, data into a visualization for the project. So lots of this kind of work around um, data conversion and visualization, but I think one thing that is uh, uh, maybe important for me is the real-time feedback. So all, using a, 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 a video game engine allows for that kind of real-time responsiveness that maybe you don't get from a traditional render. So it's something that I think um, I'm really inspired about. So these are uh, 360 images. And, and sorry, I mean, if I'm going on a tangent and, and you guys have questions, feel free to stop me. I think there's some questions in the chat. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, um, and so I think what's maybe, um, was my interest in, in, in creating um, intelligent environments. So when Evelyn was talking about, you know, die atoms being uh, a main inspiration for nanotechnology, I can definitely relate to that because that's what I focused on for my thesis was um, computational chemistry and what happens to architecture and design when you're um, designing at the level of a molecule. So again, I was trying to use a real-time environment. So I used a real-time environment to, uh, for this project, uh, for the research. And then um, in order to visualize the final output, I went to a fractal rendering program because uh, I was looking at a lot of recursive fractal algorithms uh, or uh, recursive scripts um, in the computer to generate some of these uh, graphics. And, um, and you know, I don't know if maybe, I, I know I have presented this work um, previously, so I'm not sure um, how long I should spend on this, but I do think it is definitely related to um, the, the, the work that Evelyn is doing. And I think in many ways it's been inspired um, by my collaborations with her and other scientists. So um, I figured it might be nice to mention. Sure, sure, do mention it, yeah. Um, so basically, these are all working in a real-time environment, and I was trying to convert different um, data into this environment to uh, develop a project for a design fiction uh, master's thesis. We were we were working with uh, uh, with Neil on uh, developing space architecture, and so I started basically trying to think about what are the um, what are the inputs in space and what are the uh, what are the, the challenges and how can we better design in space um, with these? So I was using a recursive algorithm to start to program um, at the level of a molecule how these kinds of responses might uh, happen at this scale. So this is basically just a, um, um, and actually maybe it's better if I show this in the other presentation, um, I have it here. This may make more sense because it has maybe more description. Um, but it was really inspired by uh, looking at things such as uh, uh, Conway's Game of Life and how maybe with a few simple rules, you get all these kinds of complex interactions. So I decided to write my own kind of rules for this environment. 
And um, what I ended up with was, you know, creating a environmentally reactive in, uh, landscape. So it's a landscape that is reacting in real time to environmental stimuli. So I started looking at graphene as kind of like the base uh, molecule for this growth system, for this algorithm, uh, because graphene has a lot of uh, really interesting um, um, complexities to it that allow it to be kind of this uh, super material. And it gives it a lot of um, potentials for nanotechnology. And so like the first rule that I developed was that this system obviously had to grow. And the idea was that this would grow in response to uh, radiation. So with levels of high level of radiation, the system would start to be able to grow um, towards and expand similar to how um, plants grow towards light through phototropism. Um, but I quickly realized that uh, the only difference between this animation here and the next one is that the uh, rate of growth was slightly higher, like literally like 0.05 and uh, of, uh, of um, what I forget what unit I was using in the environment at the time. But um, you get this kind of cancerous growth. And I was really kind of um, interested in, you know, how can you use this kind of exponential and accelerated growth and kind of contain it in a way that's going to be useful for form and uh, design. So all of this is kind of happening at the, at the molecular level at this point. And the idea was that I had to start jumping into higher, um, uh, making assumptions to jump into higher uh, states. So like if I'm looking at the molecular level, what does that mean for this uh, as a material? Then what does it mean at the architectural scale and eventually at the scale of a potential satellite or space architecture uh, community? And uh, the third rule that I basically embedded into this was to allow it to observe its surroundings. So it's basically following this uh, point of light, which represents the direction vector of uh, radiation where it would be coming from. And um, I took a lot of inspiration from corals. So I think you'll see maybe in the images and how these start to kind of play out. Um, many of the, the top, although it's a generative system and it's, it's basically coming from a bottom-up approach, many of these uh, um, decisions on how um, I should maybe limit the, the growth or I should change the growth were coming from a top-down perspective. Um, and many of that was inspired by my research in corals and nature. And now definitely my, my work with other uh, scientists such as Evelyn um, exploring these different types of natural ecosystems. And um, in the case of the reaction for the molecule that I was developing, um, it was going to basically expand over um, high levels of radiation. So this is what I would imagine, um, kind of similar to how maybe water, the molecules in water expands and contracts depending on heat. Um, I figured that this would expand due to high levels of radiation. And again, uh, one of the reasons why I was focusing on radiation, maybe that's important to mention, is that radiation is one of the biggest challenges for people living in space. Um, it has a, it, it, it can be very harmful and it's uh, very dangerous over long periods of time. So I was interested in a material that could kind of almost like absorb the radiation and uh, not just block it out, but actually use it to, um, you know, have some kind of potential for form and architecture. And so at this point, I have a base molecule that works and it's uh, operating on its own. And I was interested, okay, what does this mean for maybe at the material scale? So I started arranging these uh, together and seeing, you know, how can these different assemblies start to maybe operate whenever they're um, aligned with each other. So you kind of get this like interesting fluorescence that happens whenever the radiation direction changes um, and different kinds of ways that the organizations, these field conditions that uh, started to arise when changing the direction of the uh, radiation. And uh, just working in the real time environment, I think was uh, definitely a challenge to get some of these um, things to kind of work because you never know what you're gonna get whenever you press play and then the system kind of just uh, responds. So I started trying to figure out, you know, what are ways that I could start to control the system, iterate it um, over maybe a larger field condition and start to create more um, uh, organized and um, structures. So this is just like um, looking at ways that I can start to um, embed some of these uh, things like density of the material um, and um, maybe even the number of, um, of molecules in the system in real time. Uh, so I was just testing out different ways that I could uh, basically do that. And I started coming across these more parabolic structures that have these kinds of arches that 
would then act as the uh, underlying logic for the larger structure. And each one of the lines that is corresponding off of that would be a point where one of these uh, mo molecules would basically attach itself to. And so this is kind of more or less the first iteration that I, I kind of realized that this could start to become maybe a proto architecture. Um, and it's still at this point, it's at the material scale. So I'm kind of looking at this as if I'm looking under a microscope um, and imagining what are the potentials for this at the architectural scale. And still at this uh, microscopic level, thinking about you know maybe the relations in this case, <laughs> this really, really probably does remind me of uh, a diatom uh, that Evelyn was showing. Thinking about how you know individually these uh, these specimens are operating in a certain way, but then collectively as a whole, they start to have a more emergent behavior. So they're all just kind of responding to um, this point of radiation. So going back into um, jumping maybe a, a level from the molecular scale into the material scale, um, I was really interested in, um, if you guys are familiar with ferrofluid, because it's also a material that behaves, it's a liquid that then behaves similar to uh, more of a solid whenever it experiences a magnetic field. So I imagine that this type of material that I was developing would have a similar logic that with high levels of radiation, it would start to become maybe um, more solid or start to maybe expand um, in the direction of that radiation input. And then scaling up one more time, now I'm looking at maybe the architectural scale and imagining, okay, what would this then look like at the scale of architecture? And um, how might this maybe behave in a space environment? So the idea was that this would maybe be very open and porous whenever there's um, low levels of radiation, but then under maybe higher levels of radiation, it would start to grow um, and expand. So this is just kind of like a final visualization um, that I had done. So at this point, I jumped out of the real-time environment. It was uh, very challenging to um, program everything from um, inside of the real-time environment. So I went to a fractal rendering engine to start to leverage some of the built-in mathematics for creating the visuals for this. Um, so there is a lot of kind of um, assumptions being made, jumping between uh, not only scales, but also software. So this was more of like the visualization of the research I did in the real time, time environment. And then uh, jumping one more level, now maybe at the scale of a, 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 a city or a satellite that is um, operating in space, I would imagine that this uh, system would, or, or this satellite would be able to slowly respond to um, radiation inputs um, in, the, uh, in the orbit that it's taking around uh, the planet. And what I had done, um, I looked into some uh, maps on solar wind and was trying to kind of understand how solar wind and uh, radiation can get bent around, uh, around the earth. And then trying to kind of like figure out how I could map that to the um, system in order to have it have a certain kind of response. So it's basically just at this scale, slowly kind of optimizing itself to, um, to better respond to its environment. Um, and I'm not sure if you guys can hear the sound or not, but this is the, the final visualization of the, of the project in this environment and how I would imagine this environment could potentially respond. So when I'm looking at this, I'm not just thinking that it's just a, a material and architecture. I'm really thinking about this as maybe a new technology. So this idea of synthetic biology or nanotechnology was really interesting to me.
So I guess kind of to go back to maybe this one here. I think maybe what I was trying to achieve with this is combining all of the kind of influences I had working on these various projects with um, faculty members, colleagues, and scientists at the university, and trying to figure out, you know, what does this mean for architecture and what does this mean um, for kind of the direction I'm going with my research and my career. And I think in many ways, um, these, these kinds of collaborations with scientists and working with uh, researchers and, and, and uh, maybe um, influence of environmental science on kind of the research has really kind of brought me to the direction that I've gone. Um, but again, I still kind of always felt like it's always stuck in the computer. Um, and I was really interested, how can I basically transcend that and get that from the digital into the physical? Um, I, I was lucky enough to work with another faculty member of ours, uh, uh, Eric Goldenberg with his studio on um, a couple of projects. Um, and this was one where we were basically um, designing a series of instruments. And um, I had designed this, um, uh, cello, which basically um, was taking maybe a lot of inspiration from nature, um, but then kind of thinking about how do you kind of make this ergonomic and, and useful um, as, as, an, as an instrument for people. So it kind of responds to, you know, the, the posture and the curves that, uh, of the body and how you would maybe um, work or, or play this instrument. And this was uh, the final kind of, uh, we made this kind of frame that would house the instruments. And I think there's five in total, um, and they would basically get embedded into it. But I think um, this idea of um, maybe the digital to the physical is really interesting. And, and I always kind of think of it as these proto architectures where they're not necessarily a, um, a full architecture, maybe they're not uh, habitable, but they do you know, have complexity and uh, maybe they do have the ability to um, create space. Right, um, and this was another one that I had done with uh, Nick Jelpy and um, a colleague of his, uh, I believe from MIT, William O'Brien. And uh, he had basically designed these, um, uh, these kinds of inflatable sculptures. And um, we were basically commissioned to build this installation and I had no idea how to do it at the time. So um, it was a really interesting way to kind of think about how we can transcend the tools and the technology into, um, doing a digital fabrication for this um, installation. And basically there's these inflatable balloons. I think there's, there's seven of them. And um, they had the operable fans at the top that would then basically inflate them. And um, I think what would be really interesting when I look at this now is, you know, how can it then be maybe integrated with sensors and be reactive or responsive to people? Um, so I'm always kind of thinking about the relationship between data, um, real-time environments and um, real-time feedback. In, in some of these uh, projects and these proto architectures. Um, and so like, I try to basically work with my students on some of these ideas, um, trying to bridge that gap between um, how we are generating things, maybe sometimes generative in the computer and bringing that into a physical kind of output. So these are just some work that I had done with my students um, to try to um, use different uh, software and different mechanisms to create different types of um, proto architectures. And then um, in my personal work, I, I work a lot and collaborate a lot with um, different uh, colleagues that I had gone to school with. And this was um, one that I had done with um, Hadi Ahafar. He's a colleague of mine that uh, we work a lot together now. But he, we basically were trying to think about how we could use light as a medium and start to develop these proto architectures. So this was kind of like a telephone booth almost that has a mirror at the top and bottom. And the idea is that it could have this like infinite kind of uh, view. And um, this one we did integrate with sensors. So it was responsive to people. Um, and so we just put this up in the, in, the, in the gallery space and it was kind of like mesmerizing for people and people started kind of like going towards it and just, you know, um, experiencing um, how it was reacting to them, which was quite fun to see. Um, and so like this idea of bringing the digital to the physical and starting to get more and more into proto architectures. Um, this was a project I had done as an installation for Burning Man. Um, it's a very simple structure, but this is probably the first structure I actually had to, you know, really think about and, and build um, in my career at this scale. Um, and so it was definitely an interesting challenge, a new, new opportunity for me. 
And um, it's a very simple structure that we then draped with um, uh, this uh, material. And the idea was to bring the ocean to the desert. So it was really focusing on, you know, how can we maybe raise awareness about the health of our um, of the oceans currently. So we were trying to use this proto architecture as a way to kind of um, create and, and enhance an experience, but also to um, raise awareness about um, the, the current state of uh, our planet. So these are just graphics that we had done. We had like a, a 360 projector in there. So we were projecting all, all around. So it was called Ocean 360. So you'd walk in and be in this underwater world. And I mean, I, I think they're really at the core of all of this is um, working with data, um, working with environmental science as kind of like the foundations for the research and then trying to see how these can maybe be um, reused, rethought or um, reimagined for architecture and design. Um, and then definitely the um, ability to make that tangible and bring it into, uh, put, put something into someone's hands that they can then understand, you know, maybe something that um, wasn't, maybe a, they weren't aware of or maybe wasn't that important to them. How can you maybe use it as a means of uh, visual storytelling? Um, so definitely, I think a lot of these overlaps that are happening between um, architecture and science um, are, are prevalent in the work. Um, I mean, I don't know if like that kind of um, was able to kind of maybe uh, align with the, the what we had seen from, uh, from Evelyn's presentation, but I think definitely there's a lot of overlaps in um, the work that uh, she, she has done, um, and it's definitely inspired and influenced a lot of the stuff that I have worked on, um, especially working with uh, Neil in, in my thesis project as well. Um, I think these are all been pretty um, heavy influences. Um, I, I think that's really about it that I, I mean, I can tell you guys um, maybe some more stuff that I had done um, in regards to some of my research on Florida, if that maybe is helpful um, or interesting. Um, but I, um, I would like to open it up to questions if you guys have. Yeah, I think I think you've got to maybe have some questions if we if we do have any questions. Um, um, yeah, uh, that was that was great. I, I also just to say I put in the WhatsApp chat the the article that I wrote uh, Matter Matters, which is has has Albert's work as an as a illustration. Um, uh, it was for Scala Tibbetts, uh, a, a, a book called Active Matter. Um, do, yeah, do we have any questions? Um, I think there's one in the chat from Anna. Um, she mentioned I used nature as inspiration to design the cello. What's it sort of inspiration? Was it structural? Did you use biomimicry? Um, so it was more just looking at the the way that the position of the body and you know where do you need to have maybe um, a place that has to have a high amount of surface area to maybe um, rest against um, the leg, for example, so so you can kind of have a more comfortable position while playing. So I was looking more at um, maybe the, the response or the relationship to the body um, more so than maybe the, um, the uh, I guess, a more scientific or biomimicry approach. Um, but definitely the, um, I guess, the overall design was inspired by nature. We were always looking at um, strangler fig trees and different types of uh, network systems that have these uh, kinds of uh, geometries. But at that point, it, it wasn't really anything generative. Um, at that point, I, I wasn't getting so much into generative design. It was more, it was more a very top-down approach uh, for that project. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so, uh, any? Do we have any further questions? We could. Uh, thanks, Albert. That was great to great to see that again. It reminded yeah, me of uh, some of the things. Uh, having me, uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, uh, yeah. The time and uh, really interesting conversations, as always. I I think yeah no I think this I mean a lot of what all this this the what's being presented today um, uh, the diatoms and so on it, it's it's completely fascinating but it's it maybe it takes a while to sink in to think how it can can inform an architectural project in some ways um, uh, it, it and I think that that. Uh, as I say, in many ways, it's kind of it's it's a diff the opposite of what we think in terms of architecture because we're on the side of the developers encroaching on 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 uh, uh, on the Everglades. But um, I think when you think about it, the way the, the challenge really is how to integrate our our project with with the, the one of nature and the way that I think Gray was was speculating upon. Um, um, 
Yeah, I, I have a, um, I'm really interested actually in these uh, fractal logics. So these um, fractal forms, I mean, we see them in nature all the time. And um, you know, in many cases, nature is almost not 100% efficient. So I'm really interested in, um, you know, testing and using fractals um, for potentials in environmental science. So I'm kind of investigating, you know, okay, what does maybe service area to volume ratio, how does that maybe affect um, how a, a, a building can perform if you're using these types of geometries? So uh, uh, also maybe what are some of the um, potentials for acoustics or even um, in many cases, if you have this by like a water's edge and uh, different soils and organisms can start to kind of uh, propagate on it, what would be some of the potentials for that as an environmental response? Um, so definitely, I mean, maybe one that I'm looking at now is, uh, bringing it into this uh, form and then trying to A, run simulations on it in the virtual environment, but then also um, 3D printing it and then testing it in the real world environment is kind of where I'm, I'm going with this, uh, this research now. Great, that's, uh, yeah. Uh, so um, Actually, the, the next session we have on the DDES is going to be on Sunday, which is about material intelligence, which actually follows on very precisely from some of this. Um, and uh, we are inviting two colleagues from ICD Stuttgart um, to uh, present their work on, on particularly on, on the work of uh, 4D printing and also on um, timber, uh, the, the timber intelligence. Um, it should be a very interesting session. Also, Nick Bauer is going to be talking about some of his work using um, for structural um, um, uh, generative um, AI. Um, so I think that'll be a perfect segue into that. Uh, if we don't have any final questions, but I think we can we can call it a day. I just wanted to to, to thank even even had to had to skip out towards the end before we, we should finish. And I, I feel bad because I should have thanked her before your presentation, Albert, but I, I missed the chance. But it was really, I think, um, just to thank her in her, abs in her absence for, I think, a truly inspirational um, uh, presentation. And I think, you know, it, uh, I, I find the Evergrades completely fascinating. I mean, uh, again, not spectacular in the sense of, uh, uh, it, but super interesting in terms of the microcosms and so on at, at a certain level and, and, and a very extraordinary and rich environment that uh, we must try and protect at all at all uh, at all costs um, um, so that was I think a, a great presentation and, and thank you also for Albert I mean it's great to be able to see uh, not just your your own work but also see the way in which that some collaborations are happening across campus with the the um, the School of Biological Sciences it's it's really um, and I think that's an ongoing um, uh, area. I think that uh, Sarah is also working as part of that sort of project, and uh, Shaheen and Biyana are, are, are uh, really interesting work with them. Yeah, uh, they're all also uh, have some applications at the moment going for uh, for funding for, for further research in this area. So this is kind of like a watch this space uh, area of, of development. But I think what becomes very clear is that um, what Miami represents in many ways is a, a kind of very unique uh, ecological sort of system um, that in which it, we are at a very kind of fragile uh, position in terms of our our, our, our our footprint on the planet and there are many of these concerns which come which are really important for us to as architects to address and, and to overlook them we overlook them at our peril um, so I'd like to wrap up and, and just to th thank once more Evelyn and Albert for a fascinating uh, display of their work. Um, and we continue next week. Um, Gray Reed will be uh, a part of a team of, of, uh, of presenters looking at the question about uh, uh, how really Miami itself is a city in a swamp, um, which I think is going to be an amazing session, then followed up by a final session, which is going to be on sea level rise itself. Um, so. Uh, Thank you very much and uh, see you all on Sunday. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you. Take care. Thanks.